There were just a few women who were gathered at the tomb on that early morning of the first day of the week when they heard something from an angel that has echoed down through the ages and continues to bring joy to our hearts. He is not here. He is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. There are some cardinal doctrines of Christianity that we must believe if indeed we're going to be Christians, if we're going to be saved. And among those cardinal doctrines, we must believe in the virgin birth of our Lord. We must believe in the blood atonement. We must believe in the vicarious death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must believe in His bodily resurrection. Wonderful words of life. That's what we're considering on these Sunday afternoons. And today, wonderful words of life, Jesus' resurrection. The word resurrection itself speaks of life. Something that has been resurrected has come forth from the dead. It's been given new life. And four lessons that I want us to learn this afternoon about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we study these four lessons, I'd like for you to open your Bible to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, along with the text I use this morning, uh, 2 Peter 3, uh, is a thrilling chapter in the Bible. It speaks of the future and what a day it's going to be when Jesus Christ comes again. Our resurrection is based upon our Lord Jesus' resurrection. And that's the argument that the great apostle Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul had studied at the feet of the renowned Gamaliel. He was an expert in the law of Moses. Likewise, Paul was a great logician. I believe that uh, he would have made a great attorney. In fact, you see in 1 Corinthians 15 as if he is arguing a case, and really he is. He's arguing in defense of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and in our own resurrection from the dead. And so I don't know of a more exciting chapter in all the Bible than 1 Corinthians 15. But what I learn about the resurrection of Jesus Christ is, first of all, my Savior and your Savior is alive. Look at verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 15 where the text reads, If there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Now, there was an argument taking place at this particular time as to whether or not the dead rise forth from the grave. And Paul makes his argument, if there is no resurrection, then what about Christ? He's the Savior. We've put our trust in Christ. And so if, if there is no resurrection, then He didn't come forth from the dead. And yet Paul makes it abundantly clear, as do the gospel accounts, that Jesus Christ did come forth from the dead. Now there was no other life like the life of Christ. We understand that. What amazing birth He had miraculously conceived and born to uh, Joseph and Mary. And Joseph himself told how special this little babe was. He will save his people from their sins, call his name Jesus. And so what a remarkable birth was that of Jesus. But everything about him was remarkable. When you consider his majestic teaching, nobody taught like Jesus. Matthew uh, chapter 7 verse uh, twenty. Uh, nine, he taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. He was the most authoritative teacher that ever lived. He was the most original thinker that ever lived. But of course, we know that he was more than a man. He was a great teacher who came from God and indeed was God in the flesh. Purest life ever was lived by the Lord Jesus Christ. But then that death on the cross where he died uh, is that which we remember every Lord's day when we partake of the Lord's Supper. By partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, we remember His death on our behalf. Here's the point in the sermon today. No matter how marvelous was the birth of Jesus, no matter how marvelous was His teaching and His life, no matter how much meaning His death has given to us, it means absolutely nothing without the resurrection. 
And so the resurrection was the confirmation of all that Jesus did and taught. And he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead, Romans 1.4. You see, as marvelous as Christianity is, uh, it would only be just another world religion without the resurrection. Now, I can argue that the principles taught with, by Jesus were greater than the principles taught by other founders of world religions. But the resurrection of Christ removes all doubt into the uniqueness of Jesus Christ and what makes him different. You see, Christianity is a fact-based religion built upon this fundamental fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Death could not hold him. Remember in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus is speaking of the building of his church. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus is saying that I'm going to go out into the realm of the dead, but I'll come back again. The grave will not keep me. Uh, I will rise triumphantly over death and the grave. When we think of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are reminded that our Savior is indeed alive. Now, it's interesting to me just how far those Jews would go in order to uh, uh, try to prevent anyone stealing the body of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 27, I want you to go to that rather lengthy chapter, look near the end of the chapter, and notice beginning in verse 62. After Jesus has died and after Jesus has been buried, the text says in verse 62, the next day that followed, the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate saying, Sir, we remember that deceiver. They're speaking of Christ, mocking him. That deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. And Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now I want to tell you, if there was ever a grave that was made sure, it was the grave of Jesus. And so the Jews intended for it to be such. Pilate gave them that authority. Nature made it sure because a huge stone or boulder was placed in front of the tomb. Pilate made it sure because the Roman seal was placed there upon that tomb. Uh, Roman soldiers were there to make it sure. They set watch. Not only that, unbelief made it sure. For unbelief said, he'll never rise from the dead. And death made it sure because inside that tomb was a listless, lifeless, cold body of Jesus Christ. But up from the grave he arose. He came forth triumphantly from the dead. They tried to make it sure, but you cannot overcome the power of the Almighty. And so it is that it was so very embarrassing to those Jews when you consider what they had done to try to keep that grave sealed. If you look at Matthew 28, notice, notice the conversation. When they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city, showed to the chief priest all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money to the soldiers. These soldiers could have died because uh, Jesus' body was no longer in the tomb. Saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money, did as they were taught, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. How embarrassing for those Jewish leaders. How embarrassing for the Roman government, including the Roman soldiers. They could not keep this seal, they could not keep this stone secured because Jesus was inside that stone. And when the moment came, he walked up by his own power out of the grave. I want to tell you. The enemies of Jesus would not have stolen the body, and the friends of Jesus could not have stolen the body. What happened on that occasion was simply this. Jesus arose from the dead, and the resurrection says our Savior is alive. That's life-changing. That's transformative. Jesus is alive. It is said that over in Russia, 
that in the city of Moscow, there in Red Square, where Lenin is entombed inside the Kremlin walls, that tourists go by daily and they see that embalmed body of Lenin still on display. I understand that down through the years, particularly during the time of uh, the Soviet Union when communists ruled Russia and the surrounding territories, that there were four guards who stood watch over the body of Lenin. And that also engraved there at the base of his, uh, of his beer were these words, He was the Savior of the world. Now think about that just for a moment. Here's a man who's dead and who's been dead and he was the savior of the world. Said a missionary's wife who was in Russia with her husband decided to visit the the tomb of Lenin. And it says, keep quiet. And she always obeys the rules, but she couldn't contain herself on that occasion. When she passed by each soldier standing there guarding, guarding the embalmed body of Lenin, she said, Jesus arose. Jesus arose to the next one. Jesus arose and finally Jesus arose and he did triumphantly over the grave. Wonderful words of life. Jesus resurrection. It tells us he is alive. Now, what else does the resurrection say to you and me who are Christians? It says that this which we believe called Christianity is real. The resurrection says Christianity is real. Go back to the text in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 14. If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith also is vain. Now what is the faith? It's that which we have believed. Uh, But he says that our faith is vain. It's empty. It's worthless without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Indeed, the Christian system rises or falls on the resurrection of Christ Jesus. It would have been meaningless to go about teaching and preaching, quote, the gospel without the resurrection message. In fact, it would not have been gospel because gospel's good news. And that includes the account of the resurrection. You see, it just demonstrates, this resurrection demonstrates the power of the gospel. When Jesus came forth from the dead and there were eyewitnesses who saw him, and we know about those eyewitnesses, the apostles of our Lord, these women who gathered at the tomb would see him, the 500 brethren of 1 Corinthians 15 that are mentioned, they saw him at one time. Uh, We would note that there were two on the road to Emmaus that had a conversation with Jesus. He later went in and dined with them. And uh, this one that's, that's, that's preaching in 1 Corinthians 15, as one born out of due season, he witnessed the resurrected Christ, Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul. And what happened with these individuals? Radical change was made in their lives. Something tremendous happened to these apostles, for example. They went back to their ordinary way of living after Jesus, Jesus died. But something happened. Something big happened that was transformative. What was it? It was the fact that they saw with their own eyes and were able to feel with their own hands the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus said he would be raised again. He told his disciples this, but they didn't fully understand it. And uh, these disciples though not fully understanding it, continued to follow Jesus. And then he died and they proved they really didn't understand it. But then he rose from the dead and it would be those same apostles who would be gathered on the day of Pentecost, who being endued with power from on high would preach that message that would include the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. These, so many of these men died as martyrs, didn't they? They gave their lives, not for a lie, not for a dead Jesus, but for a living, reigning Savior. What does the resurrection tell us? It tells us that our Savior is alive. But not only that, it tells us that Christianity is real. Something else we learn 
when we consider the resurrection or the empty tomb, and that is that our redemption is guaranteed because Jesus lives. Go back to 1 Corinthians 15, and notice verse 16, If the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And uh, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If Christ is not risen, then the chief cornerstone of our faith is taken out of Christianity. And our hope crumbles to the ground. Salvation itself centers around the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We were singing about that this morning. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. And so this resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, guarantees our redemption. We have joy in our hearts now because we've been saved from our sins, provided because Jesus arose from the dead. And isn't it true, according to Romans chapter 6, that when we're baptized into Christ, we likewise are baptized into His death, burial, and resurrection? So in verse 3 of Romans 6, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death, therefore were buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. And so this resurrection of Jesus Christ is tied to our redemption without it. We could not receive the forgiveness of our sins. Back in Romans chapter 4 and in verse 25, the text reads that uh, uh, He was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. Raised for our justification. So Christianity is real. And likewise, redemption is guaranteed all because Jesus Christ came forth from the dead. Now, here's what some misunderstand. In the springtime of every year, there are people who rarely ever attend a church service who all of a sudden gather for what's called Easter service. And by the way, I saw a church building on their marquee not too long ago that I thought was had something remarkable to say. It was really good. It says, we are open between Christmas and Easter. Wasn't that good? <laughs> that was a denominational church. But it said, we are open between Christmas and Easter. And what's, what, what, what's, what's uh, the suggestion there? That you ought to come service more than just a couple of times a year. But here are all these people who gather together for, for a, an Easter service to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what? That same resurrection they celebrate will also be that which speaks of their condemnation one day. Because you see, uh, in Acts 17, in verse 30, Paul is speaking to the Athenians, and he's talking about this uh, risen Christ, and he also talks about the day of judgment. And in verse 30 of Acts 17, he talks about the need for uh, uh, repentance. He says, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Why is there going to be a judgment one day? Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Better be careful about celebrating that uh, resurrection if you're not going to get your life right with Christ. Because one day, that same resurrected Lord who's seated on his throne will call all from the dead to be judged by Him. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees our redemption. And likewise, there are those who have never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ who will be lost on the final day because Jesus Christ didn't stay in the tomb. He came forth from the dead. And He now sits in a position whereby He can be the judge. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was the center point of Peter's message. It ought to be of every gospel sermon, really. Because in Acts chapter 2 and verse 30, uh, it is the apostle Peter who says, Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that is to David, David, 
that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Just underscore that word raise. He would raise him up. In verse 31, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, neither his flesh did see corruption. And here's the fundamental fact of Christianity. This Jesus God hath raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. And finally then in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath raised up that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both made him both Lord and Christ. It's that message of a Christ who died and was buried and rose again that convicted the hearts of those who'd gathered on the day of Pentecost and caused them to cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? The empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it means our Savior is alive. It means that Christianity is real. It means that our redemption is guaranteed. And number four, it means our hope is secured. Our hope is now secured through the resurrection of Christ. Look at verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 15. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now, Jesus wasn't the only one that came forth from the dead, but he was the only one to come forth from the dead who never returned to the grave again. That's what makes his resurrection different. And so he becomes the first fruits of them that sleep, those that have died. He overcame death and the grave never to die again. And so our hope is secured because of that. His resurrection is the proof of our own resurrection. Since he came forth from the grave and since he has power over the grave, Likewise, you and I will come forth from the grave on the final day. His resurrection proves that life, uh, that life uh, uh, here is not all there is because when he was raised from the dead, he went on to be with the Father in heaven. Now, what is Paul addressing here in this chapter? Well, remember, there are some people who will say, and they mean well, that even if there was no resurrection and even if there was a heaven, Christianity would still be the best life to live. And I understand what these people are saying because Christianity takes you to a new noble way of living. And that's what they mean when they say it's the best life. Wouldn't we want to live that life even if there is no heaven and hell, but uh, heaven or, or, uh, or a second coming or resurrection? Paul says this. Paul says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, I'm miserable. Paul says, if there's not a resurrection, then I don't really have a reason to live. He says, the, the reason I live is because of that resurrection and the hope that I have in Christ. But if there's no resurrection, he says, that hope is no more. That's what he means when he says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain because I gain. When I die, I'll be raised again. And so when you think about the final day or the second coming of Jesus or the judgment seat of Christ, we realize that all of this is based upon some fundamental fact, the fact of Jesus' resurrection. And on that day when we're all raised from the dead, it's going to be a marvelous day for the child of God because that's when we get to be reunited with our loved ones. Isn't it interesting that through death, our loved ones are taken away from us, but through resurrection, we'll be reunited with them. And so we live for a period of time upon this earth and we want to be faithful during that time. Death will come to us all, Hebrews 9, 27. But Paul said, we do not sorrow as those who have no hope. 1 Thessalonians 4, 18. We have hope. And what's the whole basis of 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 and 2 Peter 3? Why do we have hope? Because Jesus arose from the dead. The tomb is not empty. Jesus would go to visit with his sweet friends, Mary and Martha. They lost their brother. Jesus loved Lazarus. He goes to be with them. Martha says, if only you'd gotten here in time, this wouldn't have happened. But Jesus was still Jesus. Jesus. 
the power of Jesus was still in his hands. And he says uh, to Martha, Martha, don't you understand the resurrection? She says, I know there's to be a resurrection on the last day. But Jesus said, but you're looking at the one responsible for it. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And what is he saying? Oh, Lazarus is still living. In fact, Jesus is going to go to the grave of Lazarus and bring him back from beyond. And I don't know, Lazarus may not like that. <laughs> because Lazarus was living all along, wasn't he? And so it is that uh, Jesus says, I'm the resurrection of the life. I've got the power over the grave. I'll bring Lazarus back and show you. And that can prove to everybody else that I've got power over the grave. Lazarus later on would have to go back into the realm of the dead. But Jesus, Jesus went into the realm of the dead and came forth never to die again. And therefore, one day all will hear his voice. John 5, 28 and 29, and shall come forth. They that have done good in the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. What did Jesus say? Because I live, ye shall live also. You see how remarkable were those words that were uttered at the tomb? He is not here. He's risen. As he said he would. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. This afternoon... I don't know what all may be happening in your life that's, that's disheartening to you. Just the grind of everyday living may be getting you down. But on this Sunday afternoon, I want to remind you that you can hold your head up high and you can keep pressing on because hope lies before you. Where is it found? It's found in Jesus and particularly in a resurrected Savior. Don't forget that. Let that guide your thoughts day and night until he comes again. And if you're subject to the invitation, will you not come as together we stand and sing?